Continuing my read-through of the Bible, I now come to the book of Joshua. Now, uh, one of the things that I keep saying I'm going to uh, try to avoid doing in my read-through of the Bible is uh, try, uh, try to avoid going all Christopher Hitchens mode as I read through uh, these books. That, that is, I'm, I'm going to try to avoid just making these reviews one long complaint about all the problematic parts of the Bible, and instead try and, as far as my limited abilities will allow, uh, get into the interesting uh, history or literature or storytelling elements that are here. But uh, I feel like with the book of Joshua and the conquest of Canaan, there is just a big elephant in the room that uh, needs to be addressed before we get into that. And that is the big... Uh, theological and historical problem that is the conquest of Canaan. So it's a, it's a theological problem uh, because in this book, the tribes of Israel are commanded to go through Canaan and just kill everybody. Uh, the young, the old, everybody. Wipe, wipe out the whole population. The, the elderly, the infirm, the children, the babies. Uh, all, all the animals and the livestock, uh, it's all uh, put under the ban is, is how the Jerusalem Bible occasionally translates this, meaning uh, everyone is just kind of wiped out uh, by the orders of Yahweh. Uh, in, in other words, uh, it's been described as a genocide, and although it's never described in any great detail, like we don't get the details of the little babies being torn from their mothers and killed, uh, that is apparently what is happening within the world of the text. So my upbringing, which I think is a, a very common experience for anyone who grows up in a religious upbringing, uh, is learning about these stories in Sunday school, learning about them in the, in the Christian school I went to, uh, and us school children being horrified by these stories and constantly asking our teachers, but why? Why would God do that? It's It's... Uh, completely different than the view of God that you're brought up with in, in the 20th century uh, mainstream Christianity church, which is uh, loving and caring and peaceful. Uh, and so the, these stories prevent, present a very uh, jarring con contrast to that and uh, has been a, a big theological problem for uh, a, a long time. Uh, Thomas Paine was complaining about these uh, stories in the Age of Reason way back in the 1790s. So at, at least as far back as then, prob probably probably much further back than then, it, it's been bothering uh, people who, who grew up with this book. So that's one problem. Uh, the other problem is a historical problem, and interestingly enough, the historical problem is almost going to cancel out the theological problem. The historical problem is that the overwhelming archaeological evidence shows that the conquest of Canaan never happened, as it's described in the book of Joshua. Uh, and uh, I don't expect you to take my word for it. Do your own research. But uh, certainly everything I've read uh, has reinforced this. Um, it looks like the uh, tribes of Israel arose from within the Canaanite community and uh, uh, may have had some skirmishes with them uh, as they became a separate community, but, but nothing, the, the destruction of Jericho as it's recorded in the book of Joshua never happened. Uh, the, the, the invading army of the 12 tribes of Israel just uh, annihilating all these cities as described in the book of Joshua never happened. So uh, in, in one way, the historical problem is almost a little bit of, of a relief. You, you read these horrible stories of genocide and you think, oh, how terrible. Uh, and then you find out that it never happened anyways. And you think, oh, oh, oh okay, well, I guess uh, I don't have to have that keep me, keeping me up at night. Uh, it, but that does raise the interesting question of why would somebody invent such bloodthirsty stories? I mean, if, if they really happened, you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, you can imagine bloody conquests like this in, in history, They're like the Anglo-Saxon invasion of England, I think was quite brutal. The Vikings uh, came in and raided and pillaged stuff, right? It's, it's historical, historically plausible that you could have tribes come in, wipe out the native inhabitants, and then say, well, 
God told us to do it. And that, that could be like the theological justification for the atrocity after the fact. It's a little bit more difficult to ponder why just make something, why make a, a bloody genocide up if that's not even the real history. Uh, there are, to my understanding, a number of different explanations uh, for where these stories come from and why they come from. Uh, and uh, the uh, Christine Hayes's lectures for Yale Open University is a good source. Uh, the Bible Tells Me So by Peter Innes. Uh, is, is also a good source both for the theological problems as well as the historical problems. Uh, but I, the, the, it could be, there, it could be any number of things. Uh, Robin Lane Fox, a classical scholar in his book, uh, The Unauthorized Version, Truth and Fiction in the Bible, uh, comments that there are some alternative explanations for where these stories in the book of Joshua come from, but then says, uh, ultimately, we don't know. And he says, we, we have to be careful about replacing one mythology uh, not based on facts with a new mythology that's equally not based on facts. Uh, so that there, there's, there's lots of questions and, and suppositions about maybe why these stories are like this. It, it does seem to be, as Peter Innes points out in his book, The Bible Tells Me So, it does seem to be the culture of the Near East at this time to describe conquests in exaggerated terms like this, like we conquered the co town and killed everybody, even when they really didn't kill everybody. Uh, he, he, he talks about uh, the king of Moab uh, writing uh, such a description in one of Moab's victories against Israel. Uh, so, it, it um, you know, it's, it's not like... Israel is just the bad guy and Moab is just the innocent little lamb here. Apparently, that, that this was just the culture all around. Moab's not part of the conquest of Canaan, by the way, but just to, just to bring that in here. Um, so, I, I felt like I had to get that out of the way. Uh, yes, the... The, 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 the morals here are problematic. A lot has been written about it. Uh, again, uh, I'm going to largely sidestep the issue, but a good book to check out is The Bible Tells Me So by Peter Innes. Uh, and yeah, the, it, it's, it's uh, essentially none of it is historical, or at the very least, uh, the book as written is not an accurate historical account. I, I, I think there are ongoing questions about whether there was some skirmish between some of the tribes that later got... Uh, exaggerated into some of the stories you may see here, or some of them originally had a historical basis that got uh, exaggerated over the years. I'm, I'm, I suspect that if I was uh, in the scholarship c community of the Old Testament, there would I, I'd be aware of numerous articles that are written on every chapter in here. But um, I'm not. I'm just a casual reader, so I'm, I'm just going to leave that there. So with that out of the way, let, let's uh, maybe take an overview. Through for this. So we uh, start uh, with all the tribes of Israel on the other side of the Jordan River, the uh, eastern side of the Jordan River. Now, in the previous book, well, Deuteronomy is the direct previous book, but Deuteronomy is not really a narrative. The previous narrative was Numbers. And in Numbers, uh, the uh, after wandering in the desert for 40 years, the Israelites emerged and went on to the eastern side of the Jordan River, where they conquered the kings and the kingdoms there. Uh, oh, what were their names? Uh, Og, king of Bashan, and was it the Amorites was the other one? Sorry, I, I, my memory is failing me. But there were two kingdoms on the other side of the Jordan River that they conquered. The tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh wanted to stay in these conquered territories on the other side of the Jordan River, even though this was not the promised land. Moses, uh, before he died, uh, said to them, okay, you can stay here, but you have to help your other tribes uh, win over the, the Canaan. You have to join in the military campaign to, to, for the conquest of Canaan. Uh, 
<laughs> then we have the interlude of Deuteronomy. Uh, and now we're picking up the narrative again. So the tribes are beyond the Jordan. Uh, they send in some spies to uh, explore Jericho. And this is where we get the famous story of the prostitute Rahab and the spies. The, the Jerusalem Bible, um, and uh, as I've mentioned in my previous videos, this is my first time reading the Jerusalem Bible. I, I grew up on the NIV version myself. So uh, the, the, all these footnotes are new to me. Uh, the Jerusalem Bible says that, that there appears to be two different traditions in the Rahab story, uh, which is why there are some things that are made a big deal of and then never come up again, like uh, this, the scarlet rope. So it, it, a big deal is made of how the scarlet rope must uh, hang outside of Rahab's door so that the Israelites know that everyone in her house is not to be massacred with the rest of the town. Uh, but that does not come up again uh, during the actual taking of Jericho. Then, then there's a, a crossing over the river, <clears throat> a crossing over the Jordan River, in which the Jordan River parts, uh, much like a, 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 a repeat of the Red Sea crossing. Um, the, the Hebrews go through a circumcision ritual, um, because nobody's been circumcised in uh, during the 40 years in the desert. Uh, and, uh, th you know, when, when I was studying this uh, story in my uh, as a middle school student in, in Christian school, I think this, despite it being a Christian school, this always got a lot of snickers from the class because, um, where is it? They circumcised all the males, and then, if I'm remembering right, uh, they create a monument out of the foreskins. Maybe I'm getting mixed up with a, a story earlier in the Bible. Sorry, I don't see that here. Uh, there's there's uh, stories. Two accounts of a stone monument being set up. And again, uh, the footnotes in the Jerusalem Bible show that these are two distinct traditions that are being uh, put side by side here about the stone circle. Then there's the taking of Jericho. And again, the, the Jerusalem Bible has some interesting footnotes that were not in my upbringing. Uh, but they say that their two narratives are conflated here. In the first, the Israelites marched around the walls in silence and are told to raise the great war cry. In the second, there is a procession with the ark to the sound of the priest's trumpets. Uh, in the text, the second account is bracketed. So th this was something I did not learn during my upbringing, although it makes a certain amount of sense because I do remember being vaguely confused when I heard this story in Sunday school. They're, they're supposed to march around in triumph, and yet there are all these trumpets. Sorry, I, I misspoke. They're, they're supposed to march around in silence, and yet there's all these trumpets that are coming around with them. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's a little bit unclear whether they're marching around in silence or not. So what the, the, the Jerusalem Bible has gone so far as to put in brackets these accounts, which uh, they identify as coming from the second account, the account where they're not marching around in silence and that they're making uh, a lot of noise. So that, that was, yeah, I'm, I'm finding these footnotes uh, interesting. Um, then they uh, try to take the, uh, yeah, and then the Jericho put under the ban. So th this is what... Um, Put under the ban means every living thing killed, uh, the exception being Rahab in her house uh, as her reward for saving the lives of the of the two spies. Um, but yeah, this is going to be common throughout the book of Joshua as everybody in the city ends up being killed. Um, then the Israelites try to take the city of Ai, but they're repulsed 
because one of the uh, people, Aiken, had actually taken some stuff from Jericho, even though he was not supposed to take anything from it. It was all supposed to be destroyed uh, as kind of a sacrifice to God. But then uh, once Joshua discovers that Achan has sinned and he is, uh, all Israel stoned him, uh, then the sin is atoned for and then they are able to take I. Um, uh, then the next point in the narrative is the ruse of the Gibeonites. So uh, the Gibeonites are living in Canaan and they don't want to be massacred. So they do a little trick where they pretend to be coming from far away and they put on old clothes and crumbly bread and uh, have old wineskins. And they come up to Joshua and the Israelites and say, we don't live in Canaan, we're from very far away. We'd like to make a peace treaty with you. Uh, the text identifies the, the problem with Joshua as that he forgets to check with God before making the tech, before making the pact. And then when they find out that the Gibeonites are actually Canaanites, uh, they still have to honor their pact uh, that they made with them. Uh, but the, the Gibeonites are going to be enslaved. Um, yeah, so the leader went on, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the whole community. Uh, I don't know if this is, yeah, it, it's, it's always struck me as, as interesting when I was uh, a, a teenager, the whole status of the Gibeonites and, and uh, you don't really hear a lot about them throughout the rest of the Bible, but they do pop up now and then. Uh, I, I think if, um, yeah, I don't remember all the stories where they popped up. One of David's mighty men was a Gibeonite, uh, for example. Uh, they, they, they do pop up at various points uh, in, in the other Old Testament narrative. Uh, next there's a coalition formed of five kings in the south. When they find out that Gibeon has made peace with Israel, they uh, attack the Gibeonites. Uh, Joshua is obliged to come to the aid of Gibeonites uh, because uh, of the pact. And uh, that's what the, it says in the text here. Although you, you can suspect that he would have to march against the five kings anyways because... He wants to conquer all of Canaan. Uh, so there's the conquest of the south, uh, and the kings are killed. And then there's a, a similar coalition of northern kings, which they fight against them. Uh And uh, where is it? It's, it's mentioned here somewhere that when the kings are captured, they're hung from trees. Oh, uh, yeah, here they are. Sorry, it's, it's, it's the Southern Coalition. Uh, so the, when, when Joshua captured the, the Southern kings, he struck them and killed them uh, and had them hanged on five trees and hung there till evening. Uh, according to Wikipedia, this was uh, an Assyrian tactic of de dealing with defeated kings, uh, especially in that region. Uh, and so uh, Wikipedia, or the sources that it's quoting, theorize that, that this is evidence that some of this was uh, put together during the times of the Assyrian conquests. Uh, like I said earlier, it's not historical. So this was obviously put together at, at a later time. Uh, yeah, so we get the conquest of the, the south and then the conquest of the north. Now, there's an interesting little footnote here. Uh, it, again, the, the Jerusalem Bible has some interesting footnotes. It says, chapter 10 and 11 describe the conquest of the whole south and later of the whole north of the land and expeditions against the coalition of Canaanite kings 
by all the united tribes led by Joshua. Then chapters 13 to 15 and 17 show the conquest as slow and incomplete with each tribe acting by itself. And this is closer to the historical fact. So I, I found that interesting for a couple of different reasons. Um, I guess the first one is my impression, and take me with a grain of salt because I'm not a scholar, but my impression based on everything I read and, and quoted, uh, at the, quoted the titles of at the beginning of this review is that the, the, nothing about the conquest of Canaan is historical. There, there was no conquest of Canaan. Uh, the, the, it, the Israelite tribes emerged gradually as a separate community from within the Canaanite uh, tribes. So I'm not quite sure what it means that the second account is uh, more close to the historical fact, because if, if there was no conquest of Canaan, then how can uh, the second account of a conquest of Canaan be closer to the historical fact when the whole thing never happened? If you follow me now, I suspect this is all supposition on my part, but I suspect what's going on is uh, the editors and translators of the Jerusalem Bible, although they're obviously critical scholars and maybe not strictly fundamentalists, uh, maybe more on the, on the liberal end of Christian scholarship, they are still Christians. Uh, and maybe it's just too much for them to say that the whole narrative is fabricated. They're content with pointing out where two traditions have been, been mixed. They're content with pointing out some of the minor contradictions in the text. But maybe to say that the whole narrative didn't happen is, is a step too far for uh, the, the Christians who are publishing this Bible. So uh, perhaps... That's why that they are, instead of saying the whole narrative never happened, they're just saying that the second version is closer to the truth than the first one. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But the other thing, though, it, I mean, it, sorry, a little bit of background noise going on. Uh, the other thing, though, just as a casual reader, uh, putting aside the actual history and the actual archaeology for the moment. Oh, yeah, uh, so, so Daddy's making a video at the moment. Uh, pu pu putting aside the actual archaeology and the actual history, uh, and just looking at this as a, a narrative on its own terms, it's not clear to me as a casual reader that the uh, the narrative starting in uh, 13 or the text starting in 13 is actually in contradiction to the unified conquest described in the earlier chapters. So it could be, it, it could be, again, just looking at the text on its own terms, that the, the broad conquest described uh, in the north and the south is... Uh, Okay. Uh, yeah, it could be that the broad conquest described in the north and the south is, is just the major uh, Canaanites being uh, conquered. And then this is kind of like a mopping up operation that's being described here. Uh, I don't know. But what we also get is we also get a geographical description of the tribe's... Uh, of, of where the tribes are. So starting with the tribes beyond the Jordan, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and then the, the tribes inside of Canaan. Uh, now, uh, these descriptions of boundaries, I guess, must be invaluable for scholars who are looking to parse exactly what the historical parts of the Bible is. But for the casual reader, this is very boring reading. Let, let me see if I can find an example. Yeah. It, it, it goes on like this for a few pages. So as regards the territory of the sons of Ephraim, according to their clans, the boundary of their inheritance Yay! to the east was Atarat Adar Yay! as far as the upper Beth Horon, and it ended at the sea. Uh, Michit to the north and the boundary to the east, Tanaset and ran beyond it to the east to Genoa, 
it went down from Genoa to Atarat Nara. So we, we just, oh, uh, sorry, one minute. Uh, yeah, uh, guys, uh, th that is filming a video here. You think you could just go out for a bit? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, those of you who are with kids will know what it's like. It, it's sometimes very difficult to find some time to myself to film these videos. I, I do what I can. It's, it's, it's either this or nothing. It's either this or just give up the hobby of, of BookTube. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's, it's very boring to read this, especially without benefit of a map, uh, although there are maps online you, you can look at. Uh, speaking of which, when I was trying to look at some maps to help me make sense of this, I, I, I came across once again the same podcast that I had come across with Numbers in Deuteronomy, uh, which is, uh, uh, what was it called? History in the Bible podcast. Uh, and uh, the, the, the guy who, who does that go, goes ahead and... Um, oh, uh, uh, guys? Uh, Rosa? Leo? Uh, the, the, the guy who does that podcast uh, describes this as the boring half of Joshua. So, yeah, uh, certainly for the casual reader, just reading all these lists of geographical boundaries, this is the boring half of uh, Joshua. Uh, he also says that uh, the geography here is a little bit confused. He's a scholar, I'm not, so we'll take his word for it. Um, but uh, apparently the... The geographical uh, boundary descriptions sometimes don't match the descriptions of the cities contained within them. Um, for uh, who knows what reason, I, I guess maybe uh, the, the boundaries may have been shifting back and forth over time. Um, yeah. Uh, then uh, the tribes uh, from across the Jordan, uh, Reuben, Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh are sent back. There's uh, almost a little civil war between them when they build their own altar to Yahweh, which they're not supposed to do. Uh, you're, you're supposed to go to Yahweh's designated temple to make sacrifices to him. You can't just make sacrifices wherever you want, is my understanding of, of what this um, what this little problem is about. Uh, but after they talk through it, peace is restored. Uh, but we are setting up a, a conflict, which um, I don't actually remember this so much from my own Sunday school days. But the podcast I was just quoting, History in the Bible, says this will continue to be a theme uh, in the narrative going forward. The, the, the tension or the unease that there are two and a half tribes living outside of the promised land, living on the east side of the River Jordan. Uh, then, because this whole thing is written by the Deuteronomistic historian, who is setting up a historical narrative in which if Israel worships God, they will um, thrive, and if they uh, worship other gods, they will be punished. And, and remember, the Deuteronomistic historian is trying to make sense of, of why uh, Israel and Judah fell to Assyria and Babylon. We uh, have this uh, here where, where uh, Joshua is giving one final speech to Israel about how they have to serve Yahweh. And if they serve Yahweh, good things will happen to them. And if they don't serve Yahweh, bad things will happen to them. Uh, and then the death of Joshua. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm going to wrap it up here. As always, there are more things you can talk about, but there's also something to be said for wrapping stuff up early. And as you can see, or as you can hear, I'm often on borrowed time when I try and sneak a few moments to myself to make these videos. So we'll finish up here. On to the book of Judges next.